like me to give the closing talk at this year's uh, FOSTEP. Um, I'm going to talk about in GPL enforcement and my efforts uh, during the last uh, months and in over a year now um, to enforce the general public license in cases where it wasn't uh, respected by certain um, corporations and organizations. Um, this is about the contents of the presentation. I'm trying to go uh, through it as quickly as possible as I can imagine that there are quite a number of questions in the end. Um, if you have any questions that are related directly to whatever I'm talking about or what is on the slide, please raise your hand and I'm trying to um, reply to that question during the presentation. If it's a question that is not really related to something that I'm actually stating or that I'm saying, please uh, try to ask the question at the end of the presentation. Okay, um, some background about me. Um, I'm an independent free software developer. I'm earning my living off writing and supporting free software since 97, so this can actually work. Um, I'm uh, mostly known for my work on NetFilter IP tables, which is the Linux packet filtering and network address translation subsystem um, of the Linux 2.4 and the 2.6 kernel. I'm not a lawyer, I have no legal background, um, so um, whenever I'm stating legal, um, whatever, legal terms or legal issues in this presentation, um, this uh, might be wrong. I'm, I'm not a legal expert. It's just what my I'm just talking about my experience with enforcing the GPL and what I've learned about the legal issues involved. Um, I think there really is too much confusion confusion about the GPL and free software licenses. If even people like the Red Hat CEO speaks about that Red Hat puts uh, investments into the public domain when he actually wants to say that they license whatever the result was of their investments under the new GPL. Um, I've never seen any public domain call from Red Hat. Um, so uh, there's really way too much. Um, yeah, a short legal disclaimer, I'm going to skip about that very quickly. Um, again, this is not legal advice, I'm not a lawyer. Um, any kind of experience I'm talking about is um, mostly based on German copyright law. Um, and copyright law is quite different in uh, whatever jurisdiction you might be in. So, um, yeah, as I said, it, it's only about the German uh, copyright law. So we're talking about the GPL, about copyright, about software. So the initial question we have to ask ourselves is, what is actually copyrightable if we think about software? Um, there has to be a certain, not everything is, is immediately copyrightable. It has to be a work, there has to be effort put into it. It has to be um, somehow, uh, in, in German we have the word Schöpfungshöhe, uh, so most people who understand that. Um, so not every single line you write uh, is, is a copyrightable uh, kind of piece of software. So there has to be a certain hate of, of effort or whatever you put into it in order to be copyrighted. Which translates into the typical development cycle of free software projects that if somebody sends you a trivial uh, patch that fixes a single line or something like that, then his contribution to the project that he is patching is certainly not going to be copyrightable and he cannot claim that he has part of the copyright and, and he doesn't actually have any rights. And you also really, if you take it correctly, don't really need his approval because it's not a copyrightable contribution to the work, so, um, so you see. Um, the question is where does it start? Where does the, the this, where is this line after which a contribution to a free software project is copyrightable and where it isn't. That's something that isn't really defined. Uh, there is no, no precedent on that. However, um, you can ask yourself questions like, um, did the programmer have a choice of implementation? Could he have been using different kinds of algorithms using uh, for, for resolving the problem, for, for uh, you know, getting the work done? Uh, these kinds of questions. And if the author has a choice to do it either one way or the other, and this choice is not only a syntactic choice, but, but a real choice of different implementations, then you can assume that whatever is the result of that choice is probably likely to be a, uh, a copyrightable one. So for me, I was surprised that the level after which something has copyrightable protection is relatively low, because as all technical people in this room will know, um, you already have a choice, even if it's only a very small bug fix. So uh, some, some uh, word about terminology. 
whatever is on this slide is not free software. Um, public domain is a different concept, freeware, shareware, hardware, beerware, whatever it is, it's not free software. End of slide. Um, the rest of this presentation will cover free software and open source software. Um, for the purpose of um, whatever I'm going to describe in the remainder of this presentation, I'm not going to make a distinction. So um, the rest of the presentation will probably talk about free and open source software referred to as FOSS. I don't want to take, time, take sides. Um, so, uh, as I have been enforcing the GNU general public license, I'd like to point out a few features of the GPL that are probably not known even to people who write code and license and under the license. Um, so, um, the first thing to know is that the GPL is a license that regulates distribution of software. It doesn't regulate use, with one small exception that I'm going to describe. But in general, the GPL regulates distribution of software, um, and it allows distribution of software and a certain and redistribution of software under certain conditions that are outlined here. Um, basically, you have to distinguish between um, distribution of the software in source code and distribution of the software in object code. So, if you distribute source code, you need to mention that. A particular piece of software is subject to the GPL, and in addition, you need to copy the license full. So you need to, if you distribute a GPL program, you need to give a full copy, the full text of the license with it. If you distribute an object code, um, you have three conditions. In addition to the two previous conditions that are also true for distribution in source code format, um, you have third. Uh, a, a third condition, which is that you either include the full corresponding source code, and I'm going back to this definition in a couple of slides, with together with the object code, or you make a written offer. The difference is that when you make a written offer, this offer has to be valid to any third party. So anybody who ever requests the source code from you, according to the written offer to clause 3b of the GPL, then you have to give him the source code. If you go for 3a and ship the source code together with the object code, then you only need to give the source code to those people who actually have received the object code from you. That's a difference which a lot of people don't actually have in mind um, when uh, uh, thinking about the GPL. So, what is complete source code? The GPL contains a very precise definition of what uh, complete source code is. Complete source code means all the source code for all modules it contains, plus any associated interface definition files, plus scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. Um, if you interpret this, you come to, well, it's the source code, obviously. Um, scripts used to control compilation tend to be make files, in, at least if you use C uh, programs with make files, it might be different mechanisms with other, uh, with other programming languages. And we have this scripts used to control installation, um, which might be the main install or something like that, uh, which comes with the program. Um, but it could be some different form of installing the program. And my interpretation of this is if you are not only shipping the software, but if you're shipping a product combined out of software and hardware, like much of the embedded systems in the networking area we're seeing, then this tool to install the executable program is actually whatever kind of software you need to uh, put, if you compile the source code, to get this resulting object code on, running onto the device that actually is included. That's an interpretation of the license. That's not indicated in the GPL itself. But I say that this is the interpretation that I made when I do GPL enforcement. Because I mean, the intent of the license is to enable the user to modify a program and to run a modified version. And if the product consists out of hardware and software, and you only ship software, but you don't include the mechanism or the scripts or tools or whatever that are needed to install that modified software on the device, then the user has no way of running a modified version, and this kind of freedom of the GPL is preempted. Um, another result of that is actually that my position on the GPL is that if you, in such an embedded case, if you sign executables, and your device has something like a bootloader or something that would only accept 
signed binaries um, by a certain key, and the key is not shipped, then again, the user is prevented from exercising his freedom to run a modified version of the program, and therefore, this cannot be GPL compliant. It's again an interpretation, it's not in the license itself. Um, of course, you can make the product uh, compliant according to this interpretation, if you offer a possibility to, uh, to install a different, or to accept uh, signatures made with a different key, something like that. You don't need to publish the key you use, but you need to make, have a mechanism. Um, and this um, has actually been enforced out of court. We don't have a court decision on that particular issue, but we've been able to enforce this signing of binaries in devices out of court. Um, the, the enforcement timeline and that kind of stuff is coming up in the next couple of slides. Of course, a very important issue with the question, yes. Uh, That's a hard question. So the question was, would it be acceptable if you compile your mind, you send it to uh, whatever company is offering the product, and then signing it for you in return in a signed binary? Probably there wouldn't be anything you could do legally about that. Um, at least from my, my experience and my background. It's of course a hard case. To, I mean, what if the company goes out of business and so on and so on? But Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, that uh, particular issue you have seen, but um, probably nothing you could do legally about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those corner cases. Um, what is derivative work is probably the most interesting question that lots of people have been thinking about in GPL, and I'm not, obviously not able to give any kind of answer to that. However, um, my position and the position that I have gained after all the discussions with lawyers and, and the experience from the cases so far is that um, I would say this is not really dependent on any kind of technology, you know, you know deal of and static and dynamic linking. It doesn't really matter. What matters is how tightly are two pieces of code integrated. I, I doubt that any court would actually decide based on, oh, this is statically linked or dynamically linked. No, it's about how tightly the two functional pieces are integrated and how uh, closely they interact. The mechanism, of, of the technical mechanism of interaction, I don't think that this is actually going to be of any interest. Um, of course, um, any kind of modification can be itself a copyrightable work, but this still doesn't mean that this copyrightable work would not be subject to the GPL. That's also an important issue uh, that some people tend to misunderstand. Um, we have no precedent on that in Germany. We, as far as I know, there has not been any precedent so far. The whole issue of enforcing software copyright is uh, very, very much, um, how can you say that? Um, very new, and there's very little precedent in this area because what happens when you know two commercial, uh, two, two companies are uh, uh, taking legal action because of proprietary software, they settle it out of court. And when it's settled out of court, you don't get any precedent. And if you don't have any precedent, then you won't be able to you know make certain kind of assumptions how courts would decide or what kind of rulings they want to. So, um, however, uh, there is, according to my lawyers, this significant indication that as soon as a code is written for a specific API that you could claim that this derived. So if you have, like me in IP tables, we have a specific IP API, how you write a mesh or a target or a connection tracking helper, specific functions. And this API is not, it's not a standard API. It's not present in any kind of other operating system or any kind of other system. And somebody writes an extension for that then um, it is our position that this extension will be a derivative work because it's so closely integrated and uses this very specific non-portable API um, that, uh, yeah, this has again been enforced out of court. Um, we have received direct X uh, connection tracking numbers and stuff like that from companies uh, which actually had to uh, com comply with the GPL after uh, legal action being taken against them. Um, Again, this is just interpretation and, and not, not something that is poor or illegally clear. Um, 
derivative works with regard to parallel code because that's what I'm mostly concerned with is uh, obviously a very hard question uh, when it comes to binary kernel modules. Um, it is my position that it's very hard to claim that binary only kernel modules in general are not derivative works. The problem is that you cannot make any kind of general uh, assumption or a general statement about that because it really needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I mean, there might be a driver that has already existed for another operating system and then has been ported to Linux. Then, it, you know, and okay, this has existed before. How can it be derived from from the Linux kernel? But um, it's really dependent on on, uh, on the particular case, and you cannot make a general assumption like, oh yes, all drivers cannot be derived to work or something like that. Um, an interesting issue, for example, when speaking about derivative works and drivers, for example, is header files. Header files, if they contain inline functions, that, uh, can certainly be copyrightable work, and if they are also covered under GPL, which the kernel, you know, it just states this source code is subject to GPL. Um, and then the contents of this inline function ends up in your proprietary driver, there you have your copyright right. Um, the, the GPL also has some, uh, some words about collective works or collective works, um, which don't actually have a representation in German copyright law. So I can just say, well, it, GPL says something, but um, that's not something that, that has a corresponding uh, part in, in, copy, in the copyright legal system. <coughs> what the GPL says, it, it is not the intent to claim rights or contest your rights to work written entirely by you. Rather, the intent is to exercise the right to control the distribution of derivative or collective works. So that's the first sentence in the GPL which mentions collective works. <coughs> and we have a second sentence which says, mere aggregation of another work with the program on a volume of a storage medium a storage or distribution medium does not bring the other work under the scope of this license. Uh, so we have two different parts. One of them is mere aggregation, which is like a Linux distribution, SUSE, Red Hat, Debian, whatever. Uh, I'm just mentioning SUSE and Red Hat because they actually include proprietary software and free software on the same CD, Debian doesn't. Um, and it disallows collective works, um, which is, yeah, uh, for me it's, it's a real gray area because at least in, in as I said, we, in Germany we don't have anything that cor corresponds to that. I'm not sure how it is in other jurisdictions, and certainly there is no precedent in that case. So, um, another issue that is important about GPL uh, is well, what I call non-public modifications. So the GPL regulates distribution. As soon as you distribute object codes, you have certain obligations to also distribute or offer to distribute the source code. So what happens if a company develops, or a company downloads a free software project, let's say it's the Linux kernel. Um, it's covered under GPL. It makes a modification. It never ships that modified version to any other organization or individual. It never distributes it outside of the company. In Germany, however, uh, copyright law doesn't actually differentiate between distribution within an organization or without an organization doesn't actually know about organizations at all. All it cares is um, this, uh, the, the term distribution, or the, the German translation of the term distribution, is actually defined by um, whether or not you distribute it to somebody who is not closely <coughs> related to you, or who is not like a close colleague or something like that, or a friend, a personal friend. So when you are in a large corporation and you distribute, in quotes, a uh, modified GPL license software to another department where you don't know anybody or to whom you don't have any kind of personal relationship, then according to copyright law, it would already be distribution and the GPL would come in. Um, so when you do that and you really want to make it correct, um, you have to always, even inside your organization, include the source code together with the binary because then you are in GPL section 3A and uh, you have fulfilled the license. However, if you only ship the object code from one department to another department, then um, you have implicitly this written offer, and the written offer has to be valid to any third party, and any third party can be outside of your organization. That's, that's a really interesting thing that I came upon, which I've never heard of before, and which I had no idea about. Um, as again, this is German copyright. Might be totally different in any other European or other country somewhere else. 
So what happens when I violate the license in your GPL? Um, basically, the GPL uh, is violated when one or more of the obligations that are not fulfilled, and it automatically revokes the, right, the usage right. So I've been saying that the GPL regulates distribution of software, um, but not use. This is the single ex exception. So when you, let's say your company A, and company A uses some GPL licensed software, it creates a, a modified version, or even a non-modified version, and does not adhere to all the license conditions, not copying the full license text or not mentioning that the GPL, uh, the software is uh, GPL licensed or uh, not offering the source code or shipping the source code, um, then you don't only lose the right which you actually don't have to, to make copies and distribute it because that's the copyright infringement part, but you also lose the right to use that software by yourself. That's, that's the, an important issue. Uh, and this kind of clause that automatically revokes the usage right, uh, you might think, well, this is really hard for them. Um, but on the other hand, this is uh, something that is present in any kind of, or almost any kind of software license uh, you, you will look at. So this is nothing that is speci uh, specifically hard within the GPL, but if you look at uh, you know, proprietary licenses which we, uh, with which uh, corporations are used to be dealing, they have the same process in there. So um, GPL enforcement, the interesting part. Um, the GPL violations then, oh, question. Can you make a difference between copyright violation and GPL violation? When do I do a copyright violation and when is it specifically a GPL violation? Well, it's also a, copyright, a copyright violation on, uh, is always a GPL violation if the like, copyrightable software was licensed under GPL. Okay. So I'm using the two terms interchangeably because I'm only talking about the GPL here. And any GPL violation is automatically a copyright violation, um, assuming that the GPL would be enforceable in the respective co copyright system. Um, and even if it would not be enforceable in the respective copyright system, then whatever user doesn't have any valid license to use the software, so it's again a copyright uh, violation. So. You, you won't be able to avoid that. Um, GPL enforcement. Uh, GPL violations themselves, or license violations, or copyright infringement, or whatever you might call them, is certainly not something new, and I think it's as old as free software itself. Um, the Free Software Foundation in the US, I've been talking to even more them um, last year, and they've been doing GPL enforcement uh, very quietly for a long time. Um, However, as I said, they're doing it quietly, and they're doing it in silent negotiations. Um, so, uh, you don't really hear it all that much about that. Um, the reason <coughs> GNU slash Linux type um, made the GPL license software to be used quite more often, especially in commercial environments and in commercial products, um, which well, uh, as a result, um, actually increases the number of, of violations we see. Um, as I said, the FSF enforces these kinds of violations. Obviously, it can only enforce um, violations where code is actually uh, used that the Free Software Foundation holds a copyright. Because only the copyright holder can actually enforce. Nobody else. So if the FSF doesn't have any copyright on the Linux kernel, so they cannot enforce uh, some uh, money misusing the, the Linux kernel and uh, not according to the GPL. It's only the respective copyright holders. Um, the Linksys case. In the year 2003, um, the Linksys case was uh, publicly, uh, well, uh, what drew a lot of attention in the public. Linksys was selling 802.11 or Wi Fi or WLAN or whatever you might call it, um, access points and routers, and some of them. At that point, one of them uh, was actually using quite a number of GPL licensed programs such as BusyBox, the Linux kernel, IP tables, and uh, a number of others. UC Lipsy, well, UC Lipsy is LGPL licensed, so it's probably. <laughs> anyway, there was lots of free software licensed components in this product, and they did not adhere to the license. So the FSF, lots of people reported that to the FSF, and a number of uh, copyright holders, together with the FSF, who also had some copyright. Uh, involved in that, um, 
were founding an alliance to, to bring access into compliance with the GPL. Um, it was this usual quiet approach, but it wasn't so quiet because somebody had posted on the news site that there was problems with Linksys uh, uh, products. But uh, the actual enforcement was quiet. Nobody outside of that alliance would actually receive any emails or see what's going on or what kind of this, what's the status of the negotiations and so on. Um, and in the end, my my summary of what was going on is that Linksys bought itself uh, an, a lot of time. So what they did is first very bad on that, oh yes, we now need to investigate and blah blah blah, blah and uh, here is the source code, and then it was like maybe 10% of whatever they have required to release. And then it got back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and about four months later they had presumably all the source code they were supposed to, re to, to release. And um, if you think about the wireless market, then you have, it's not true in the big case. <coughs> But in general, you have product life cycles as short as six months, and if somebody can delay uh, releasing the source code uh, four months, then basically uh, you could say, well, um, he's buying him enough time so the next product is actually being sold until he releases the source code and it's already old source code of an old product. Um, so a, a number of developers didn't agree with that uh, kind of uh, slow and non-public and kind of enforcement. I'm not trying to, to, to make the FSF uh, look bad in any kind of way. I mean, everybody who is a copyright holder can do whatever kind of uh, strategy for enforcing a license as he or she wants. And um, what the FSF is doing is certainly valuable work. But if I'm talking about my copyright, I can do the kind of enforcement I think is appropriate. And uh, some developers, including me, did not agree with that kind of approach. We said, well, first we need more publicity about that, because if we don't have public cases, then publicity will not know about that there are certain restrictions or implications of using GPL uh, software. And if they don't know, we will see more and more cases. So we need enough publicity, we need enough coverage for uh, IT manager kind of people to be hearing about this in order to prevent further GPL violations from happening. That's the idea. Um, and the other thing is that the violators don't actually lose anything by first complying and then wait for, well, I said the FSF, but it could be any other copyright holder in the respective case. So what you do is you build a product, you include GPL software, you don't comply with the license, then you ship the product. Then first the user has to find it out. When the user has found it out about it, he informs copyright holders. The copyright holders then have to verify and think of legal action, then they would negotiate and so on. And in the end, like after a couple of months, they comply with the license, but they didn't actually lose anything by not complying with the license in the first place. That's, that's the issue. So why should a company uh, release or comply with the license in the first place if they don't lose anything by waiting until somebody comes and complains and negotiates. So that's, there's no point in, in complying with the license initially. So that, that was another issue. So we started our own um, uh, enforcement. And uh, well, a typical case looks like this. User sends us a notice about software being used in a product. Um, then we are verifying this. I'm, I'm uh, re-engineering the firmware images, doing actually a test purchase of the, of the device. Um, seeing if there is a written offer, um, and so on. Then in the end we will send a uh, warning notice uh, using a, a lawyer, send a warning notice to the respective company that you know there's something wrong with this and you're actually violating our license and <coughs> please sign a letter to cease and desist. The letter to cease and desist is a legal document where you say, well, uh, yeah, there was something wrong um, and we're not going to do it again from now on. That's what the letter is to cease and desist is. And if you violate that letter that you sign, um, then you're actually liable to, you know, in addition to copyright violation, you have a contract violation and contract penalty and that kind of stuff. Um, so if they don't sign that kind of statement, you actually have to, in the end, go in front of court. And in order to go in front of court, you need some kind of uh, technical expertise by a uh, technical expert that's recognized by court. So what we did in the two cases so far is um, had a, a technical, a recognized technical expert uh, do that study. 
apply for a preliminary injunction, and in those both cases we got uh, uh, the preliminary injunction. The preliminary injunction basically then bans the company from distributing any more of the products until they fulfill the GPL license. That's the idea of that injunction. Um, if the statement was signed, the declaration to cease and desist, um, we're actually sitting together with them, or lawyers negotiating. Um, the details, the details um, are things like, um, uh, I mean, this is just about cease and desist, but there might be details about the company has a couple of thousand of devices already produced, which are missing the GPL license, and they still want to sell them without actually opening all the boxes and putting a couple of pieces of paper in and closing them again, because it's just too expensive, so you might probably negotiate on that and probably get some kind of donation out of that. Um, that's what we actually had. We got really a, a number of donations for charitable organizations out of those cases. Um, and uh, yeah, also donations are good for, are good for the public relations. Um, it doesn't really look that good if you say, oh, they have this copyright issue. Question. How long did you take? Wait, what? Uh, the schedule. Um, in Germany, we have the issue that a preliminary injunction can only be granted when it's urgent. And it's only urgent if it's less than four weeks after you've known that the copyright is infringed. So you have to do this, all of this in four weeks, otherwise you lose the chance to obtain a preliminary injunction. That's the kind of timeline you have. Um, but four weeks for negotiations should actually be. Um, so what we have is out of court agreements with uh, more than 25 companies so far. Um, there's going to be a list of examples next couple of slides. We obtained a preliminary injunction against uh, the company Sitecom. Uh, it's a Dutch vendor of wireless access points. Um, they didn't agree with the injunction, um, so they appealed against the preliminary injunction, and the appeals case was also lost. Um, and uh, that's uh, yeah, uh, well, basically what happened in that case. Um, we have a second preliminary injunction against one of Germany's largest technology firms. I'm not, we haven't made a press release about that, so I'm not going to say which one um, at this point. And we have a number of more settled cases that are not public yet, just because uh, yeah, writing press releases and that kind of stuff takes time, and my time is uh, uh, limited at some point. Um, we're negotiating in more cases, and we already received quite some public awareness. Interestingly, more awareness from the legal community than from the software community. <coughs> Um, I've received way more journalists from legal journals inquiring about what I'm doing than I've received from, you know, computer magazines and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, that's the first slide uh, with a uh, number of uh, company names. Uh, people find uh, companies like uh, US Robotics, Siemens, ASAS, Tomcom, um, uh, Gigabyte, Feeding. So you see this uh, Sun, uh, uh, Siemens again. Like the telecom, the country, and a number of others. So it's not some small garage companies, but companies with large legal departments who should know better about what kind of license they use. Thank you. 
And certainly the, this uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about the GBL never holding up in terms of uh, wrong. Um, future GPL enforcement. I think it's a really important issue in free software. Um, as unpleasant as it is, I'm a very technical person. I like to write code. I don't like dealing with lawyers. But um, it's just too many of these cases coming up. I think I have a number of the upcoming slides. I've, so far, I think I know about 117 and more individual <laughs> infringing products that I've received email from users. And the number is growing every week. Um, so the, the, it is an important issue. And I think we will inevitably will happen in court uh, more often, and even uh, in other countries, probably not, not only in Germany. I mean, Germany is convenient for me since I'm in Germany, and since the German legal system tends to be quite reasonable. Um, and it's also convenient because it's Europe's largest market for all these kinds of computer and, uh, and uh, uh, IT devices, so uh, nobody can afford to just not distribute a product in Germany, but uh, in other countries. <coughs> it's a too huge market to lose, um, uh, so that, that's uh, uh, probably a good point to start. Um, I'm very interested how this is going to happen, or what, what is going to happen with the Creative Commons and, and the copyleft uh, kind of content. Um, I think it will certainly be, if they don't have them yet, uh, people misusing a uh, Creative Commons license uh, uh, content. What kind of problems do we have? One of them is um, distributed copyright. Um, distributed copyright, I mean that um, if thousand developers have worked on a project, then everyone, every of these thousand has a part of the copyright. This is a safeguard against anyone buying all the copyright or, you know, buying in quotes. Um, but uh, it can also make enforcement difficult since uh, uh, that's not the kind of way how the copyright system traditionally has worked. You, you won't find uh, you know, um, other kinds of works where you have copyright distributed among such a vast number of uh, individual copyright holders. Um, what I've been doing is enforcing um, this cease and desist kind of issue. I've not been enforcing damages so far. Um, it's because I'm not interested in money, I'm interested in them complying with the license. Of course they have to pay the legal expenses and stuff, I mean that's sure, but I'm not trying to make money out of that, so I'm not claiming damages, or well, maybe I'm claiming them, but I have not enforced any damages so far. Um, also, this would be really, really different if you do it in front of court, because then the court has to distribute the damages for the whole project. So even though I only own a certain percentage of the copyright, I can go in front of court and I can claim damages. Um, but then the damages received have to be distributed, and then you have to, you know, have quantities of which kind of person involved in your project receives which percentage of the money, and this is certainly a very difficult task because you cannot really only count the number of lines in CBS or something like that. It's not that easy. Um, so this is a diff difficult issue. Um, the legal issue of having to do reverse engineering in order to prove copyright infringement is a problem actually because uh, reverse engineering um, is something that uh, is, uh, can be restricted by copyright. So uh, European Copyright Directive actually says that um, uh, you know, in order to do reverse engineering you need permission from the copyright holder. But if you reverse engineer something where you in the end determine that you are the copyright holder, then you can give yourself the permission. But if you re-engineered something and it was a negative fit, then actually you infringe copyright. Um, so uh, that's sort of an issue. Um, however, um, the European Copyright Directive also states that you are allowed to do reverse engineering for interoperability purposes. So if a device doesn't run Linux, I'm doing the reverse engineering in order to make it compatible with Linux. Um, only the copyright holder, which is in the free software world in most cases, the author can enforce the copyright. Um, that's what well, I consider it as a problem because uh, devices are sold worldwide and uh, are produced worldwide, or software is copied worldwide. And uh, I'm only here in Germany, and I'm not really feeling very um, well confident if I, for example, would have to enforce copyright in Uruguay or whatever. Um, so that, that's actually an issue. Um, and uh, 
one of the problems I also see is the communication problem, which is getting better now. But uh, there are lots of users discovering that uh, DPL license software is running somewhere in a product, and they don't receive source code, even they, after they request source code from the respective companies, and they don't report it to copyright holders, which is important. Because uh, sometimes I go to a, some kind of web forum or something, uh, totally unrelated, related, and I see, oh, uh, somebody is basically in the, the thread is documenting that there is a DBL violation going on, and it, it's about natural drive details. But I didn't know about this, I just knew it accidentally because I was reading that report. So why is it like that? Why don't users report it back to the copyright holders? That's the only way you can do something. Or you can even start to do something. Um, yeah, that's also why I found it this DPL violation support website, which is in a <coughs> bad state, I admit that. I'm, I'm not a web designer, I'm not whatever. Uh, I'm mainly a coder, uh, so I'm, but any, anyway, I started that as a platform so people can actually report um, copyright issues and then I would tr I will try to, to confirm that and probably go after it more and more copyright on and so on. That's how the, the 170 reported alleged violations, I haven't confirmed all of them, uh, uh, come from. So, uh, at the moment, this DPL Writers Org project is mainly only backed by me, so it's a one-man show. Uh, we had one contribution from Alan Cox so far, who contributed the FAQs. We had one contribution from uh, a person whose name I have uh, embarrassingly forgotten, but uh, he's listed on the thanks uh, side of the webpage who did the logo. Um, but apart from that, uh, volunteer is needed. Um, another issue is about uh, the final slide of this presentation is what can we as free software developers do in order to um, facilitate later enforcement to make it easier, any kind of possible later enforcement we might have. Um, practical rules for proof by reverse engineering. Um, don't fix typos in error messages. That's honestly what the technical experts, the court recognized technical experts on software copyright is telling me. You shouldn't fix typos in error messages. Because it's unlikely that somebody else who writes a similar piece of software will make the same typo. And that's the kind of things which these experts use in order to prove that there is a copyright violation going on just by looking at the object rule. Um, leave obscure error messages like we have in NetFilter. Rusty needs more caffeine. It's very unlikely that somebody else who writes firewalling code will put this exact error message in the code. So even only if you have this single string in an object file, you will automatically say, be able to say that there is an almost infinite probability that this is a, a copyright infringement. You cannot make a 100% proof, but it is already enough to, to, to convince a court. Uh, make the binary contain the string of the copyright message, not only the source code. <coughs> so, um, this is uh, important, um, so in, you, if you just look at the object code, you have the copyright message there. Then you can say, well, uh, if you put it there, somebody who wants to infringe can just remove it from there. But then it's automatically proven that it was willful infringement, which is different from accidental infringement. So, um, yes, question. Oh, no, it, it doesn't require, it recommends it, and it requires it to print out if the original unmodified program uh, had a printout, if I'm not mistaken. I think the thing that... Yeah. <laughs> so, and if you write a, you know, a device driver or something, then it doesn't really interact uh, with the user all that much. So, um, yes, but uh, make the binary contain the string. Um, if you ever want to... Yes. There is another trick that Cisco is using is to put special features which are undocumented, like a bug. And if that bug is present to a, another router, then we know it must be a copyright infringement. Yeah, so but... We have to put bugs in it, but special features are undocumented. Yeah, but... Um, so you don't have, you don't have to, to check the binary. You check the external behavior of the box. And it presents the same... Yes, that might also help, but I'm not sure whether I would recommend that. Um, the, 
practical rules if you ever want to claim damages is that you really need to keep track of which amount of code is coming from where and you um, probably need at least the real name and the email address, the valid email address of the people who contribute to the project in order to do this kind of distribution. Um, you could consider something like the FSFA, uh, FLA, the Fiduciary License Agreement. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it with the free software. I mean, <laughs> of course, it's always nice if you uh, assign copyright uh, in the Fiduciary right to the Free Software Foundation Europe or to the FSF US. But um, you can even do that with your own project or something like that. I mean, uh, this is basically um, trying to avoid this distributed copyright uh, thing, which uh, is going to be difficult if you claim damages. Um, make also sure that employers are fine with contributions of their employees. So if you receive something from foobar at cisco.com, then you might actually ask him whether his employer, employer is fine with him sending any kind of contributions to a free software networking product. project. Um, so if you find out about it, uh, I think it's usually not good to make it public immediately. Um, because if you make it public immediately, if you put it on Slashdot, and then um, the original author only, or the copyright holder who wants to enforce it, only knows it like two weeks later, then you have this problem that, you know, the company will be able to claim that, oh, this has been known, you know, it wasn't slashed out, it was public knowledge, so your period of four weeks already starts at that point. Um, so, uh, tell the copyright holders, but don't tell the public immediately. And uh, the, the, uh, the copyright holders should immediately uh, contact uh, legal counsel. Okay, that's what I wanted to present. Uh, my usual thanks, I'm not going to read that. Um, I'm open for any questions. Yes, please.
I, I don't have an exact sum, but I think over the over this the last year we have obtained something like ninety thousand euro of donations for uh, free software related non for profitable uh, organizations. So um, I think that's uh, also uh, quite a success uh, to, to um, put put uh, donations out of that um, into the free software community. Back. Actually, don't say that these companies are uh, spared by these uh, cost of no. Um, if you look at the numbers we are talking about in this wireless market, Linksys has sold millions of uh, wireless routers. Um, I cannot really. Uh, I'm telling you this with Linksys because Linksys published this somewhere. Um, I German copyright law also has the provision that the companies actually need to tell me how many how many copies they made. Uh, and to whom they have sold these uh, copies. So I know that, but I'm not allowed to tell you that information. I also know that all of these companies, uh, the number of these companies have very large numbers. And then if you see how, how big the legal expenses is, then this is a couple of cents per device, so this is not really a, an incentive. But the, 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 the danger of a preliminary injunction is an incentive. Because as soon as the preliminary injunction is there, you're not allowed to sell your devices anymore, which is a common uh, economic problem. Yes, please. Pardon? Which kind of thing is it? No, you can. In Germany, you cannot. You can only do something like that if you have obtained a preliminary injunction and then they violate the injunction. I mean, then they're in violation of a court ruling, and in addition, there is some whatever other kind of quite uh, on scale which they need to take. Um, <coughs> questions? Um, that over there, yes? Um, 
I don't think it would be wise to uh, to start several legal uh, proceedings going on in multiple countries at the same time. Uh, it just multiplies the amount of work needed. And uh, I mean, if they release the source code in Germany, I mean, a Spanish user can also get the source code. Uh, so. Yes, they still cannot comply to the license and not include a Spanish written offer or whatever in, in the Spanish box sold in Spain. But uh, then he goes to the website and then he will, you know, find the source code. Or something. So it's not that much of a practical issue. Another question.